Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Monday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Jim Garrity is on spring break. David French of National Review is in for Jim. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. We have good, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives today. And David, literally, just as we're recording this, and certainly by the time folks listen to this a little bit later today, we now have nine justices on the U.S. Supreme Court. Welcome Justice Neil Gorsuch, who has confirmed on Friday after the rules showdown on Thursday. And, David, this is good news on so many different fronts. Obviously, virtually every conservative is happy with the choice of Neil Gorsuch. They like his record. They like his idea of actually adhering to the Constitution and the law, uh, concepts that have become controversial lately for some reason. Uh, it's also a good time to remember the strategy that paid off for Senate Republicans uh, for basically stiff-arming Merrick Garland and President Obama by saying that uh, it's too close to an election, let the next president decide. And obviously, there was the gamble that Hillary Clinton could have gotten elected uh, and put a, a, even a deeper liberal than Merrick Garland on the court. So uh, in addition to everything else, uh, this is a, a pretty good day to celebrate for conservatives. Oh, absolutely. I mean, let, but let's, let's just get one thing out of the way. All of these Democratic crocodile tears over Merrick Garland Let's just state for the record that had the roles been reversed, had, say, a uh, a leading liberal had stepped down from the court in the final months of a Republican administration and the Democrats control the Senate, does anyone think, <laughs> anyone think that they would have given that person a hearing or a chance to sit on the court? I mean, absolutely not. They know it. We know it. All of America knows it, which is why outside of sort of core activists that buy all these talking points <laughs> that uh, this was this was politics as usual. Truth be told. So let's just get that out of the way. As far as Judge Gorsuch, I mean, look, this is why an awful lot of people voted for Donald Trump. I mean, like this is one of the main reasons I would say the Supreme Court of the United States is is one of the key reasons why Donald Trump is president. I mean, I know in a in a close election, you can say, well, it's because he paid more attention to Wisconsin. or But he had to get to the 61 million votes or however many before he could even start to get into contention to make it close. And and he built an enormous, uh, he, he built part of his enormous voting base around the Supreme Court. And, uh, and let's face it, he came through this pick. I mean, give credit where credit's due. Absolutely. And I think a lot of people go to that second debate, the town hall style debate, where they were asked about Supreme Court justices. And Trump said he wanted someone in the mold of Scalia, someone who would adhere to the Constitution. And Hillary Clinton rattled off a bunch of liberal political positions that she wanted her nominee to agree with, from uh, defending Roe v. Wade to same-sex marriage to uh, working wages and everything else. And it was clear uh, from that point, uh, at least from those statements, what we would have been getting uh, with a Hillary Clinton nominee. We'll be talking a little bit more about Hillary a little bit later in this edition. But uh, welcome to the court, Judge Gorsuch. Uh, big cases coming up. I'm guessing, David, the, the Trump uh, travel ban will get there eventually. Uh, we've got uh, other big cases coming there, I'm, I'm sure. So uh, that, that union case uh, that ended in a 4-4 split might make its way back there eventually. Um, anything else that, that you know is coming down the pike on that? Well, there's a reported religious liberty case coming up dealing with these um state constitutional amendments, these so-called Blaine amendments that were passed in a, a wave of anti-Catholicism many years ago, which are very hostile to religion and are being used actually to discriminate against religious Americans at the state level. There's a case, so there's a case involving a Blaine amendment coming up. And then, you know, just the normal course of business in the next two, three, four, five years, we can't even foresee some of the uh, really critical issues that the Supreme Court will be deciding. And look, I mean, you know, look, Judge Gorsuch is one of the most promising judges in my lifetime to get on the court, but you can never be sure until they're there, until they start deciding cases. So I'm extremely excited to see him get on the court. I have this little bit voice whispering in the back of my head that says, you know, you always have to wait and see how judges actually rule. So let's wait and see now how he actually rules. But uh, I will say this, upon his nomination and confirmation, I can't think of a judge that was more enthusiastic than this judge. 
Certainly the case. Let's move on to our bad martini, and it really, really is bad. This is the Reuters version of the story. It happened yesterday. At least 44 people were killed in Egypt in bomb attacks at the Cathedral of the Coptic Pope and another church on Palm Sunday, prompting anger and fear among Christians and leading to troop deployments and the declaration of a three-month state of emergency. Islamic State claimed responsibility for the attacks, which also injured more than 100 people and occurred a week before Coptic Easter with Pope Francis scheduled to visit Egypt later this month. The assault is the latest on a religious minority increasingly targeted by Islamist militants and a challenge to President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, who has pledged to protect them as part of his campaign against extremism. The first bombing in Tanta, a Nile Delta city about 100 kilometers or 60 miles north of Cairo, tore through the inside of St. George Church during its Palm Sunday service, killing at least 27 people and injuring at least 78 The second, a few hours later in Alexandria, hit St. Mark's Cathedral, the historic seat of the Coptic Pope, killing 17 people, including three police officers and injuring 48. The Coptic Pope had been leading mass at St. Mark's at the time of the explosion, but was not injured. So, uh, David, with all the chatter about Syria, and rightly so in the last couple of days, uh, a stark, sober, and uh, frustrating reminder that ISIS is still active, not only in that region, Uh, but in Libya and a lot of other places as well. And this is a menace that is not going away. Yeah, and let's not forget the truck attack in Sweden uh, on Friday. I mean, this, you know, a lot of people use the phrase the new normal. I mean, I I think it's sad to say, I mean, we're at a state in this world where a certain degree of terrorism is expected as a quote-unquote new normal. And and I think it's... this is a doubly bad martini because you have the individual tragedy for all of those families. Um, and then you have this emerging reality that I think is a big terrorist victory. Uh, it is now, the terrorists have now reached a point uh, more than 15 years after 9 11, in which major governments in the world are on, are, it's, it's as if they're switching into a mode of saying, well, we can't eradicate terrorism, but what we'll do is, uh, we'll we'll manage it. We'll keep it to acceptable levels. And no one's saying that. Everyone's saying all the right words uh, about you know this is any this this has to stop. It has to end. But you know we're not taking any dramatic new steps. Uh, no dramatic new measures that would be designed to try to stamp this out. And and I you know look you'll never get rid of terrorism entirely. You never will. But the fact of the matter is that Europe is seeing an increased amount of terror attacks. The United States has seen more attacks and plots in recent years than any time that after right after 9-11. Uh, you're seeing, you know, the Middle East is, is more unstable than it even usually is. Uh, so all of these things are adding together to where terrorism is becoming part of the new normal. Now, there is some hope on the horizon as American allied forces approach Raqqa and Syria as, as uh, we're squeezing Mosul. We may be able to get a, control, a handle on ISIS, at least ISIS as a caliphate. Um, but again, I mean, the Western democracies are, and, and our allies in the Middle East are facing a reality uh, where terrorism, it looks like terrorism is going to be a part of our lives for the foreseeable future. Yeah, I, not a huge surprise, but uh, just the fact that uh, this is relentless uh, in so many different ways. And uh, with this being... Uh, the week leading up to Easter, uh, you have to believe that uh, there will be at least plots uh, in the next several days here, and hopefully none of them will be successful. Uh, David, let's lighten the mood considerably uh, as we head into our crazy mar- <laughs> into our crazy <laughs> martini here and head to the pages of the Washington Examiner. Uh, Hillary Clinton is still having trouble with the fact that she lost, and she's having a lot of trouble with why she lost. Uh, this is from T. Beckett Adams. Hillary Clinton emerged from the woods this week uh, for her first big interview since the November 8th election. Over the course of her soft focus conversation with the New York Times' Nicholas Kristof, the former Secretary of State identified some of the reasons she thinks she lost to President Donald Trump. Clinton blamed FBI Director James Comey for reopening the investigation of her private emails in the final days of the campaign. She blamed Russia for allegedly meddling in the election by reportedly hacking the personal email accounts of DNC staffers and her chairman, John Podesta. She blamed WikiLeaks for publishing the stolen emails during the election. She blamed the weaponization of information. She also jokingly blamed her chief Democratic primary opponent, Bernie Sanders, and the media for her general election loss. Uh, Christoph asked, to what extent do you assign blame to Bernie Sanders, to the media, for focusing on emails? 
Uh, how much time do we have? Clinton laughed after checking her watch. She also blamed misogyny. Uh, misogyny played a role, and that just has to be admitted. And why and what the underlying reasons for that is, I'm trying to figure out myself. So uh, Adams goes on to explain some of the reasons that Hillary could have mentioned uh, from her own campaign, uh, not even mentioning the fact that she's the one who was ultimately under FBI investigation for a time. Uh, so, David, what do you make of the uh, the blame game here in 47 different directions except back at herself? <laughs> well, you know, look, let's let's be clear here. She was such a bad candidate that she lost to a person who was caught on tape, that tapes were revealed during the course of the campaign, late in the campaign, where he laughed, where Donald Trump laughed and bragged about sexually assaulting women. Now, we don't know if he actually did or didn't. He was accused by multiple women. But could you imagine any other presidential race in American history, or at least in modern American history, where a person can be caught on tape? bragging about that kind of conduct and go on to win. Uh, he was also attacked a gold star family. I mean, we, we live in an era where one gaffe, one misstatement can dog a politician uh, for a lifetime. And Donald Trump was a gaffe machine. Well, you don't even want to call them gaffes because they were intentional comments that he doubled down on again and again. So you go back and you look at the Trump campaign and you say, well, you know, there were the Democrats were positively gleeful that he got the nomination, gleeful, uh, assumed that they were going to win. And what Hillary is telling us, well, is if you, uh, well, basically, if you, if you didn't report on my corruption, I might have had a better chance of beating this guy. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's absurd. But, you know, I tell you what, this lack of self-awareness, this laugh, lack of self-reflection, it's laughable, but there's a darker side to it as well. Because what the darker side is, is it essentially blames outside forces for faults that were with her within herself and within her party. Uh, and that does not lead to any sort of self-reflection that could be actually productive. Instead, it leads entirely to what we have been seeing, which is this, who can I blame other than myself for my own staggering and colossal failure? And let's not forget, this isn't the first time. I mean, she in 08, in 07, her lead over Barack Obama was staggering. She had a staggering lead over Obama, and then it turns into a loss. She had a staggering lead, I think more than 50 points over Bernie Sanders in New Hampshire and Iowa, and it turned into a huge loss in New Hampshire. And I don't think anyone will ever know if she actually won the real vote in Iowa. Um, I, you know, she won a lot of coin flips. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's not a spectacular politician there. Let's just say that. Um, and so lack of self-reflection uh, and, and a complete lack of understanding about the dynamics of the race. I mean, uh, so, you know, look, there's a million reasons when you're talking about less than 100,000 votes in about three or four states uh, could turn it one way or the other. So you can always point to this thing or that thing. Uh, but there, the reason it was even so close as to be potentially influenced by uh, a Comey letter or whatever is because of a cascading series of failures, including a lifetime of corruption. Uh, so uh, Hillary needs to spend a good long time, a period of time in self-reflection rather than accusations. Very well said, David. I love the fact that she also blames women for being misogynistic. Uh, I, <laughs> she says, I think in this election there was a very real struggle between what is viewed as a change that is welcomed and exciting to so many Americans and change which is worrisome and threatening to so many others. You layer on the first woman president over that, and I think some people, women included, had big problems. Well, David, pretty amazing coming from the woman who spent the early part of her primary campaign basically telling people that the fact that she was a woman was one of the best reasons to vote for her. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, in, in this reducing somebody down to their gender, and that's the single most important factor, is really astonishing. I mean, can you? what's her message to a woman who doesn't like Obamacare, a woman who's pro-life? Well, you know, I know you disagree with all of my positions, but I'm a woman too, so vote for me, or you're a self-hating woman. I mean, that's not compelling. I mean, that's something Bernie Sanders had huge support from millennial feminists and huge support. And they were offended by the notion that, uh, well, you don't even have to talk to about, about really about health, uh, healthcare and education and college costs and all of that 
because you're a woman. Um, I mean, she was upsetting a ton of Bernie Sanders supporters in the primary with that kind of thinking. So, you know, it's reductionist, it's identity politics. And while there's a large group of Americans who love identity politics, can't get enough of it, I'd say there's a larger group of Americans who are kind of sick of it. And people are sick of it, even in her own party. David, uh, as always, you say it perfectly. Thanks so much for filling in for Jim today. And we'll talk to you again down the road. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. David French of National Review and for Jim Garrity today. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. And be sure to tune in on Tuesday for the next Three Martini Lunch.